both my grandfather and stepmother, step grandmother, uh, believed that it was important uh, to give people the opportunity for education, and that people of color, particularly Black Americans, was who they were thinking of, needed that opportunity. In 1947. Mr. Noyes decided that half the scholarships would go to non-white students. Yes. This was a time when you know, civil rights was not even thought of, or if it was thought of, it wasn't moved on by the government or anybody or the private sector, and certainly foundations were not picking up the ball. And uh, as Ann said, Mr. Noyes' belief in his own upbringing of hard work and fairness and having an opportunity, he wanted to make sure that that was embedded in the foundation and that people of color would have an opportunity to. From the very beginning, diversity has been incorporated into the foundation and has just been part of the evolution of who we are. In the beginning, it was Mr. Noyes' decision to do it, and he just thought it was the right thing to do, is to make half his grants go mm -hmm. to non-white students. And then, um, as we evolved over the years, we then, I think, became more deliberate about our internal operation, yes. thinking more about our board and our staff. And that's probably, that probably came around the early 90s, late 80s, mm -hmm. early 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, then became, we became more intentional about it at that point. And then I think the second stage was right after the first uh, National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit when uh, we had been funding that for some time and then I think we became aware that it was not only important to fund it but it was important to have those views represented at our decision-making table. And I think institutionally both the board and the staff we're just committed to this. We've, and I think the, one of the lessons is that when you take this journey and it is a journey, there's going to be you know, uh, mistakes you make, there are going to be bumps in the road, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that you feel really good about because it's hard work and, and you commit to doing it and you be very deliberate about it. But you do it, we do it as a partnership and what we've learned is that once you make the commitment and once you do it, it becomes part of you. It's part of this institution. It's hard to separate, it's almost hard to have this conversation because it's almost like mm -hmm. what we do. I mean, here we are, two white people talking about this. But um, I think we've, we've talked about it enough where we're very comfortable talking about it because it's just part of what we believe and part of the value system of an organization. If the organization could have sort of a, a, a soul, this would be part of it. Having this um, way of looking at the world, and as Vic said, it's, it's built in now, so it seems almost artificial to, to be talking about it. Uh, is something that makes the foundation uh, effective in today's world. Well, we don't want to be an ATM machine. We want to be a, you know, a partner with our grantees. So um, for us to be successful as a foundation means that our grantees have to be successful. And I think that to the degree that we are um, giving them resources, again, whether it's money or, or assistance, and that they become better able to, to survive these ups and downs in the economy, then I think we, that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But make no mistake about it, they need the money, um, and they need the grants, because that's, that's the way the system works. The groups we fund tend to be under-resourced. They don't get a lot of grants. They don't have a lot of access to power and money. So they, they tend to have a, get a little more of the effect of these downturns in the economy. But certainly, when, when we talk to folks about being self-reliant and empowered, they understand the ability to go out and raise money on their own and to try to diversify their funding base. And, and they understand that it's, it's really up to them to move this issue forward. Yeah, our grants are not just for projects, but also for general support. We do a lot of technical support. We I introduce them to funders. We um, get them on panels so that they get visibility, so they begin also to move in, in the funding world. And, and I would say um, 
to foundations who are thinking about this issue is not to be afraid. Um, it is hard work. It does take a commitment, but it is very rewarding individually because you learn a lot. Uh, and I think you become a better grant maker, but institutionally too, because I think your organization continues to stay relevant as the world changes and you make better grants, I think. Um, I think the one thing we try to do, we talk a lot about this. Um, we try not to preach. We try to be clear that we think this is the way to go. We think it's the right thing. We think it makes good business sense. But we don't want to be preachy. What we'd rather is to be more conversational. We want to have this conversation with people. We want to share what we know. We want to share what we don't know. Um, what we're still trying to figure out. This is, there's stuff that we're learning all the time. So we want to have the conversation with folks, and we don't want them to feel embarrassed or uh, ashamed or afraid or opposed. We just want them to open their mind and have this conversation, and we want to do it with them. And, if, and I think that, that's the message that, that, we want to, that we're willing to share this with you. To hold foundations up to a higher standard than society is probably a little difficult to do. I mean, we don't talk about it in society. We live different worlds for the most part. Um, you know, the segregation that exists. I think what you have to do is um, make a, at least have some leaders, thought leaders in your institution that are going to say, let's try this. Um, and. It's an organizing campaign. It's, it's, you're, you're not going to wave a magic wand and make people feel comfortable about talking about race. But you could at least um, give people models, give people tools so that they can begin that conversation. Uh, it's going to be difficult. It's, it's always difficult. Um, and f particularly for white people of privilege, it's, it's difficult to think about all kinds of things. You know, what Anne was talking about. White men traditionally have the power, you know, in foundation world, white men have the power. So if you're talking about breaking that down, uh, or at least changing those dynamics, well, you're affecting the white men who are in charge. So there's a, there's a little bit of a threat there. There's an embarrassment there because they're not sure how they should react. But I guess I would, the message I would convey to other white people is that we have to be an ally here. This is not just an issue for the communities of color. This is an issue for all of us to talk about race and talk about an equitable society and social justice. That we have, a, white people have a role in that too. Um, so we can't just be on the sidelines watching. Uh, and sometimes we can't be the leaders. But we can certainly be part of the process of having that conversation. So that's, that's how I come at it. And because I, I think some people do wonder sometimes where I get off talking about this. But I believe in social justice and I believe in in having an equitable society. So I'm either going to talk to myself or talk to somebody else. And I prefer to talking to somebody else uh, about this and trying to um, be part of the process of solution. When it's framed as what we want is an equitable society, that's a way of, of starting the conversation. So how do we make what we have more equitable?